Welcome. This is going to be a rough one. You should know that at the outset. It involves a girl who was kept at home her entire life. She never had one friend, at least as far as I know. When she was allowed to leave the house briefly to pick up something at the store, or allowed to get her hair done, her mother was with her at all times, and some of those who heard the girl speak, shy and glancing at mother to see if it was all right, thought that she may have been mentally retarded. When she was young on these rare outings, she would have seen children playing, birds singing, and people actually going places. Where were they going? She realized there was a wider world. Imagine. And at age 19, who didn't notice those gorgeous 1950s magazine covers? The women were so glamorous, and the fashions so wonderful. And the men, those alluring, strong, confident men, movie stars, and people doing things, and accomplishing things, and helping the world be a better place. And her city of San Francisco, of all places, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, with a diversity of cultures and vistas and theaters and department stores and parks, and yet she couldn't know it and love it. That's because her mother loved her completely and told her all she needed to know. In fact, when Lucretia was born and named after her maternal grandmother, Lucretia Waters, her mother told her father, we're never going to be separated. Lucretia and I will be together all the time, every day and every night. When Lucretia was old enough to go to school, her mother forbid it. She said, I won't let her go. I'd be miserable without her, and she would be miserable without me. Her father said, You can't let the child grow up illiterate. Her mother said, I'll teach her. I'll teach her to read and write and whatever else it's necessary for her to know. I can do it better than a school teacher because I love her. Nursing may have went on longer than he thought was normal, but he also knew better than to argue with her, so he backed down. And so year by year, Lucretia grew up, unknown to the world except for an obscure notice in the newspaper. On June 11, 1946, her name was listed with a few other children who were having their birthdays. Lucretia was 11 years old. We can imagine her mother or father made a big surprise of it. Look at that, Lucretia. Your name is in the paper. I can also imagine if it was her father's idea, his wife flashed him an angry look. For Lucretia, at least, it was something as another day and another day and another day dragged on inside the home and she passed through puberty, delayed perhaps, but nevertheless much like anyone else. That's how it went until the morning of October 20th, 1954, eight years later. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the former Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force in Europe that fought to set much of the world free, was president and reaching number one on the Billboard music chart was Rosemary Clooney's mournful song, Hey There. It begins, Lately when I'm in my room all by myself, in the solitary gloom, I call to myself, Hey there, you with the stars in your eyes. Love never made a fool of you. You used to be too wise. My, oh my, in light of today's story, that's a heartbreaker. If I could afford the rights to play it in the background, I would. Don't go, but after this is over and you need a good cry, I suggest you find it and give it a listen. Now, on to our story, where we find ourselves on a gently graded street of neat little row houses with similar upstairs floor plans. And yet, if we were to look upon 778 Sweeney Street, we would have seen a large, heavy cement block in front of the garage door, placed there to keep the door from being opened. If we stepped into the front stairwell in the quiet, we might have heard the unmistakable sound of water running through the pipes. But of course, that is not that unusual. 
what would have been unusual if we were to fly over the tops of those houses and see the mostly tidy backyards and their cement patios, lawns, and small gardens, was 74-year-old Mrs. Lucretia Waters bursting out of the back of the house, frightened and horrified out of her wits. She herself was unharmed, but she had just seen something incomprehensible. Mrs. Waters ran from the house to a neighbor's house and pounded on the back door. The neighbor immediately attended to her and asked, For heaven's sakes, what's the matter? Mrs. Waters cried out, My daughter, my granddaughter, they're dying. They may be dead now. Will you call an ambulance? Please tell them to hurry. In a few minutes, the ambulance arrived from Mission Emergency Hospital, as did the first police officer, patrolman Jack Russell. Mrs. Waters ran down her neighbor's front steps and told them her daughter and granddaughter were in the house lying in pools of blood. Getting in through the garage door was out of the question. Mrs. Waters unlocked the front door, which meant she had to use three keys because it had three locks on it. The first thing that was evidence to the ambulance men and Officer Russell was the sound of running water. In the bathroom, water was running in the shower and bathtub, and water was running in the sink. 49-year-old Mrs. Spallino was unconscious, her body mostly on the floor of the bathroom with her feet in the hall. Her face was bruised and blood was evident on her clothes and on the damp floor. It was soon learned that she had taken poison and may die. As she was being placed on the stretcher, Officer Russell found Lucretia, 19 and brunette, laying on the floor of her bedroom, which was more appointed for a little girl than a young woman of 19. She wasn't moving and was covered in blood. A butcher knife lay near her body, though it was not bloody. The most striking thing was that her face was an awful blue. Blood vessels were broken in her eyes. There was a deep and dark ring around her neck and she was unquestionably dead. The water continued to run and a little dog ran about barking in its strange little upset voice. More police arrived, including inspectors Frank Ahern and John O'Hare. As they looked around, Ahern found a bloody claw hammer in the girl's bedroom closet matted with hair, and a length of electrical cord from under the bureau. Mrs. Spolino was sent to the hospital to recover, if she could, from the poison she took, and when able, to provide some answers whether they were defensible or not. Her daughter was sent to the coroner's office, where it was determined that she had five hammer wounds on her skull from a claw hammer. But those vicious blows didn't kill her. She had been strangled to death with the electrical cord. As for the butcher's knife, she had tried unsuccessfully, the police believed, to use it in self-defense. At least she put up a fight, which would indicate she wasn't as unintelligent as some of those who met her might have thought. The detectives inquired and found out that her husband, the man who took a back seat to his wife's iron will, was at work as a salesperson in Palo Alto, and so he was sent for. That left the elderly Mrs. Waters, the sole survivor. What had she witnessed? What could she tell the police about that morning? She sat in a kitchen chair and wept before she was able to talk. After all, she, frail from a heart condition, she too spent her time in the house with her daughter and granddaughter, and yet survived. As the police continued to process the crime scene, they made some alarming discoveries. In the kitchen, all the canned food had every single label removed. Just shiny silver cans without any known order to tell them apart. And as it was in the bathroom, here the water was running in the sink and out the drain pipes too. Throughout the house, the windows were screwed down and those in the rear were boarded up. 
Who had done these strange things, they asked as Mrs. Waters, her complexion pale and her body trembling, steadied herself and provided the desperately needed answers. She said her daughter, Mrs. Spolino, was responsible for everything. It was her daughter who removed the labels because she was afraid they would steal the labels and get her fingerprints. She triple locked the doors and screwed down the windows and blocked the driveway so that they couldn't get in. And perhaps strangest of all, she kept the water running because she believed that they had put wires in the pipes. Officer Russell was the first to ask what she meant by wired faucets. Mrs. Waters said she didn't understand, but it was her daughter who said that they had put dictaphone wires in the faucets so that they could hear what was being said in the house. Mrs. Bellino believed that if she kept the water running, then those listening in would not be able to hear them over the water. But who, she was asked, was they? We will come back to that. In the meantime, they needed to know what Mrs. Waters knew of the violent disturbance. Through tears, she stated that she had been lying in bed in her room. She heard a commotion and the dog was barking. She got up and in the hallway she found her daughter stumbling about, looking ill. She asked her what was wrong and Mrs. Spolino told her to go back to her room and close the door. There's nothing that you can do, she told her. Mrs. Waters obeyed and returned to her room, but a few minutes later she came out again because it was quiet except for the dog. To her unbelieving eyes, she found her daughter, now lying on the bathroom floor immobile, and her granddaughter, well, in her condition, next to the butcher knife. Oddly enough, the police believed Lucretia put up a fight to defend herself in the small confines of the house. But Grandmother Waters seems to have either not heard it or was not willing to check in on them until after Lucretia was strangled to death. The next day, Mrs. Bellino, who had been taken to San Francisco General Psychiatric Ward, was taken and was examined by the clinical director, Dr. David Wilson. No doubt the pressure was intense by the detectives to interview her as soon as possible, and seeing that she could speak, Dr. Wilson gave the okay for the patient to be interviewed. At first she refused to speak to either the police, a priest, or her husband, but soon enough she was talking. Inspectors O'Hare and Ahern and Assistant District Attorney Francis W. Mayer questioned her. Surprisingly, perhaps, Mrs. Spolino had no trouble talking to them about anything under the sun except about the one thing they wanted to know, why she killed her daughter. No matter how many times they must have said, okay, we'll get back to that, and no matter how many times they asked her again in clever roundabout ways, she simply would not answer. They turned to her husband, and really all he could tell them is that she had become increasingly paranoid and difficult to live with, so much so that he had recently moved away. What about the people his wife feared? Who were they? Well, that was rather an evolving question. It was communists, but now it seemed to be the FBI that she thought were attempting to get her fingerprints on the labels or break in or listen through the pipes. Before his present job, Mr. Spolino had worked for a place his wife was unhappy about, and so she wrote a letter to no less than Senator Joseph McCarthy because her husband was going to join the Union, and she thought McCarthy should know the Union was run by communists. He was so embarrassed, he quit his job. She also wrote a letter addressed to the Supreme Court of the United States, but did not send it, very upset that the FBI would not leave her alone. Either way, communists, FBI, it didn't seem to make a difference who, but she was greatly agitated by their activities against her. At the same time, their daughter was getting older and expressed a desire for more freedom. Mr. Spolino supported her in this, but her mother opposed it with all her heart. 
She would never let Lucretia leave the house alone, and not because she didn't love her, but because she did. The thought that their enemies, who were trying to break into the house in the first place, should have the opportunity to take Lucretia into their clutches and destroy her was unbearable. Not on her life. And so the extra locks went up because Lucretia must not leave and break her mother's heart as well. Mrs. Spolino did all she could to convince her daughter that she can never ever leave, for to leave was to go against everything she was so carefully, carefully groomed to believe. After all, they had each other. But then, with all the force of a great earthquake, which would roar up through a massive fault line of possessiveness and insanity, the inevitable terror was let loose because, for whatever reason, Mrs. Spolino felt it must. The attack launched. Lucretia threatened to use the knife. Eyes full of tears, pleaded with her mother, and attempted to scare her off with it. Anything. But how could she know that her mother wasn't just trying to injure her, but had actually decided, with a terrible determination, to hammer her to death? Her bedroom provided no protection just the quiet walls and ceiling she had looked upon day after day, year after year, some years watching spots of mildew grow and catching spiders to entertain herself with. And so she found herself helplessly overpowered, the knife knocked from her hand, not knowing if it was the end, saw flashes of her mother and metal, heard a large crack, and then spun down, her mother with her, only semi-conscious of the yelling, her hair being pulled, the weight on top of her as they landed, and further sounds of metal on scalp and skull. They hit the floor heavily, and it was like hands were pulling her through the floor, and she saw things from her life, the way the fog silently rolls in over the hills, the bumblebees that buzz by, children running up to her, a girl saying, that's a pretty dress, What's your name? Did any of it ever really happen? Her lungs still breathed in the stale air, as well as the animal and human skin particles from off the floor, but her mother wasn't so out of her mind as to not know that breathing meant life. Mrs. Bellino got up, found the electrical cord, and wrapped it around her daughter's throat. Die, Lucretia, die. She pulled on the ends as they wrapped around like a ribbon creating a crossover in the back. Yes, like the ribbons she used to place in Lucretia's hair when she was so young and pretty, not like she had become. Go, Lucretia, go. The cord sunk into the flesh and Lucretia's tongue pushed out. This world can't have you. Lucretia breathed her last. Can a psychotic woman hate herself? Was there a moment of rational realization that she had done wrong? No, she thought. She started to whisper, I had to do it. I had to do it. She felt some relief, but then felt momentary anger at the petty officials she had been writing to who ignored her very real dilemmas. They wouldn't understand this either. So she looked around and placed the hammer in the closet and the cord under the bureau in an attempt to make it look like she hadn't done it. But what if the FBI had recorded the murder with a hidden camera or, or a device they placed behind her eye? No sooner than she had thought of it, from deep in her chest, a bewildering grief shot through her. She missed Lucretia. Oh, my baby, oh, my baby, life without you is not worth living. Instantly she saw all things clearly and would drink the poison she had stored away. Must rush, must rush. There was no time to clean herself up or hide her daughter's body because they could be here at any moment and would certainly torture her for what she had done, not just for Lucretia but for attempting to expose them all. Look where it led, 
you evil organizations. I tried to tell people, I tried to tell people. The poison was retrieved from her secret hiding place and believing she could hear the FBI trying to open the windows and open the locks with increasing intensity, she drank it down. Her mother momentarily interrupted her thoughts, but she was clear enough to tell her to go back to her room and that there was nothing she could do. Alone again, the poison quick acting. If she had wanted to lay down next to Lucretia, to embrace her in death will never know because she passed out on the bathroom floor. Her husband would later say, mother and daughter loved each other dearly. They were inseparable right up to the time this happened. But of course, that wasn't the end. The wheels of justice were set in motion and Mrs. Bellino, restrained to a hospital bed, had a formal charge of murder filed against her. Naturally, court proceedings would wait for the outcome of psychiatric tests. She continued to be interviewed and spoke freely on any number of subjects. But when asked about her daughter, she would stop and only gaze back at the detectives. She resolved never to speak her daughter's name in the hospital except for once, asking her husband, Is Lucretia dead? He nodded yes, and she pleaded with him, Help me to die, too. Whatever we may make of her refusal to explain why she killed Lucretia, Dr. Wilson declared to the newspapers that she is mentally ill. She probably has been mentally ill for many years. He based this on conversations with her and knowledge of her actions, of denying her daughter a social life and the things she did to protect the house from unseen enemies. Also in the process of the investigation, the examiner reported that homicide inspector John O'Hare learned that a day before the murder on Tuesday, Mrs. Bellino and her daughter were ejected from the post office building, 7th and Mission Streets, by deputy marshals. They had gone there, he said, to seek to testify before the federal grand jury about subversive activities. O'Hare said he found a number of letters Mrs. Bellino had addressed to federal authorities alleging that the FBI was persecuting her. Four days after the murder, a curious story ran in the examiner. It reads, Some of the supervisors are wondering whether their tolerance last Monday may not have contributed to the Lucretia Bellino murder. Mrs. Vernal Spolino, the deranged Mission District woman who strangled her daughter, turned up at the board meeting in an obvious state of mental illness. She insisted on addressing the board with a weird and incoherent account of persecution by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Federal Grand Jury. Board President George Christopher had to call upon the police officer on duty in the chambers to quiet the woman but nobody thought to detain her for medical examination and treatment. This light treatment of the incident is explainable by the fact that the city hall, any city hall, seems to be a magnet for mentally ill persons, particularly those who imagine persecution. I recall the little man who came in to complain about what the works department was doing to Van Ness Avenue. I made Van Ness Avenue he explained quietly. As a matter of fact, I made the world. There was an elderly woman who showed up in a real state of fright, pursued, she said, by a band of Ethiopians who had followed her all the way from Washington, and another who abruptly went into a rapt dreamy ballet at the top of the grand staircase, waltzing slowly down step by step, discarding her clothing as she went. She, the police, did detain, and her soft, happy babbling was a chilling thing to hear. Five days after the murder, the grand jury voted a murder indictment against Mrs. Bellino. Deputy District Attorney Norman Elkington said a trial will be held for Mrs. Bellino, who is confined in the psychopathic ward of San Francisco Hospital, to determine her sanity. The murder indictment was a formality, the chance of a jury trial and conviction was remote. 
Just two weeks later, on November 10, 1954, on page 38 of the Oakland Tribune, a small article appeared about the size of Lucretia's birthday announcement in 1946. This one read, Mother Who Slew Girl Held Insane. It took a San Francisco jury but 10 minutes today to judge Mrs. Vernos Polino, 49, insane when she murdered her 19-year-old daughter, Lucretia, at the family home in San Francisco. Mrs. Polino had several outbursts during the hour-long sanity hearing before Superior Judge Eustace Cullinan, Jr., contending that she is sane, but two doctors testified that she is mentally ill, suffering from mental illusions, schizophrenia, and paranoia tendencies. Assistant District Attorney Francis Mayer told the jury he felt she is not capable of going to trial. Mrs. Spolino was accused of beating the girl to death at the family home at 778 Sweeney Street, October 20th. Well, it was beaten and strangled to death, wasn't it? But who wants to quibble over the details which can quickly fade? And who in San Francisco even knows about that family anymore? One thing is for sure, Mrs. Spolino would never return to her little house on Sweeney Street at least not as a mortal. I told you it was a rough one, but we might learn a few things. I don't say we can learn a lot about Lucretia's mother because she was insane. Her persecution complex was with her for many, many years, perhaps all through Lucretia's lifetime. Should a child be entrusted to such a woman? No, not with a persecution complex as serious as hers. Everyone gets a mild persecution complex from time to time, especially if they are bullied. But obviously, Mrs. Bellino's delusions expanded to include a personal threat by communists, people of a worldwide social and political system that was the number one enemy of the United States at the time. And then her mind shifted to the FBI, a federal crime-fighting organization that ironically actively investigated Communist Party members and, famously, alleged members in the United States. Mrs. Bellino was clever, though, in that by force of will, she manipulated and cowered her husband and mother into allowing her to live with windows that could not be opened and with doors that were triple locked. Yes, they were the two responsible adults in the house, but they endured the problem, and by so doing, or humoring Mrs. Spolino, they became enablers. How they didn't see the home was a madhouse, and a young girl was the prized possession and captive of a smother mother from hell, I truly don't know. Or, as I say, they went along with it. And just as things got worse, and that's considering what we really don't know about the previous 18 years, the husband and father moved out. He was what we call an ineffectual male. We cannot say he was able to foresee the type of violence that would occur, but could he not have found a way to get help? For all we know, he may have had his own selfish reasons for keeping Lucretia home, while he lived there anyway, while she was young. And I know where some of you are going with that, but I rather think it was because he went along with what his wife said. A lot of people do with a domineering spouse, even if the spouse is partially delusional or angrily believes unsubstantiated views about health and other areas. Years before, Mr. Spolino may have reasoned, since his wife insisted, that homeschooling has its advantages. And in truth, I'm not here to knock it or pursue the pros and cons. So then Mr. Spolino perhaps didn't mind homeschooling that much, but he may have asked his wife about other opportunities for the girl outside the house. Because of his walkaway nature, perhaps she merely had to say, we'll see, and he let it go at that. As time went on, he began to be conditioned not to interfere with how his wife ran the household. As such, her dominance in the home became complete. He implied that he left home to shock his wife into snapping out of her delusions, 
but that may not have been true in the sense of his trying to help his wife. There's a good chance he said it to save face in light of the murder and attempted suicide. Not that we can blame him for not wanting to live with his wife anymore, but the cement block, the water running, it really doesn't take a genius to realize that things were out of control. Maybe he didn't want to die himself, but he should have realized that his wife might, as they say, lose it, flip her lid, go crazy. In case you are thinking that maybe it was difficult and expensive to get someone committed, I think in a case like this, it was just more of a hassle. I have no doubt that under free psychiatric review by the city and county of San Francisco, competent doctors would have sent Mrs. Bellino to Napa, the insane asylum, not the wineries. Had they seen the house, met the daughter, and interviewed this very dangerous psychotic. Instead, Lucretia never got to know freedom and died in her drab little bedroom with its tiny little closet and boarded up windows. Now, turning to Lucretia, said by some to be mentally retarded by a few people who met her, as you have seen from the photo, she does not present the typical facial features of Down syndrome, so I would say it's unlikely. She was a socially isolated child, like the kids in the large Turpin family who were rescued and their parents sent to prison. So Lucretia may have developed speech affectations that sounded strange to the average person, even though she primarily had her mother and father to listen to. And then it is now known that severe childhood social isolation can have a negative impact on brain development. Sometimes it's been called the forbidden experiment, that is, to see what would happen to a child completely or mostly left alone, which Lucretia was not, but there is some correlation. One of the most familiar cases was that of Caspar Hauser in Germany, a boy found wandering after he was released by his captor. Light and sound bothered him because of his previous quiet existence in a dark room. A doctor tried to help him, but the youth was later murdered, suggesting someone was afraid he would learn to communicate more about his background. Another famous example is that of the girl given the name Jeannie by her Southern California doctors. Kept in a crib, when she was rescued, speech therapists tried to help her develop language, but the theory arose that she had been isolated for so long, and this is important, that she passed the threshold of brain development needed to learn speech as normal children do. In other words, if you were not taught to talk by repetitive hearing, mimicry, and practice, as all humans learn when you were a child, you will not come out of an isolated room somewhere and pick up language in the same way as when you were young. If you are isolated with someone else, however, you may develop your own language or a combination of signing and simple sounds. So back to Jeannie. As a result of not being spoken to enough in her early years, she was unable to advance despite truly dedicated efforts of psychologists and speech therapists. Some of these children have small, underdeveloped bodies from lack of proper nutrition and exercise as well. So it stands to reason that their brains were stunted also, as seen under x-ray, surely one of the cruelest of factors. So as in the other cases of social isolation, it's as though Lucretia was deprived of the oxygen of normal physical and intellectual development. She may have seemed childish to those who met her in later years, but if only someone had seen more into it, even if she was special needs. Not that you or I walking down the street would know anything if we saw them. Next, because Mrs. Bellino kept her for herself with her probable undiagnosed schizophrenia, perhaps somehow in her late teens, Lucretia may have grown tired of it all and wanted to leave. What if she dared to say, as many a girl has said to her mother, I don't have to listen to you. 
What if she began to suspect the things she were told were not true, and she said, I don't believe you. I am my own woman now, and you can't stop me from leaving when I want to. Words spoken, words to die by. But we don't know, really. It seems a stunted girl without friends and experience would not have been as strong-willed an important distinction. So look at it this way. She may not have been so dramatic as to say, I'm done and I'm leaving. It may merely have been, with much lowered expectations, asking if she could get a little job like her father, in fact, to help the family, or take classes, for instance, to be a hairdresser, which she would have had to go to school for, just a chance to stretch her wings. However, any reason given to leave the house on her own was unthinkable to Mrs. Bellino, and it disturbed her greatly. And then, if that was not it, we must ask what else could have driven Mrs. Bellino to attack her own daughter, wholly apart from any notion that Lucretia was asking to leave home. It could be anything that tied into Mrs. Bellino's expanding delusions. She could have suddenly believed her daughter was working for the FBI and was sending off coded messages to the enemy. A little thing like a half-written poem and unusual drawing, redecorating her room, the tapping of toy typewriter keys, or words she thought she heard her daughter speak may have set her off. Even a little thing like Mrs. Bellino not being able to find something could have aroused suspicion about her daughter taking it. The recent visit to the post office with Lucretia in tow is enough to indicate a rapid uptick in delusions that Mrs. Bellino believed they were both equally a part of. Unfortunately, many only half see the mentally ill, and if they prove a nuisance, if they waste time and interrupt the flow, they've got to be escorted off the premises. And we understand that. We wouldn't want our business and customers bothered by someone who may be dangerous, would we? It's unfortunate, though, that post office officials who heard Mrs. Bellino spouting off and saw her with her now-grown daughter and the officer who removed them could not have held them and requested family services, who in turn may have led to both of them being evaluated. But it's no use to think any such efforts were a possibility for them under the circumstances of merely being an annoyance. If Lucretia's own father and grandmother were not in the least willing to step in, if they had never insisted on local health authorities examining them, the girl had no chance. As you've seen, the house is still there. Largely the tragic and lonely life of Lucretia Spolino and her murder are forgotten. But now we remember and have to realize this type of situation still exists. Children sometimes malnourished and covered in filth continue to be discovered to this day, and delusional, even apocalyptic-minded parents still have custody of their children, mostly living apart from society, but sometimes in nice suburban homes. And Lucretia, gone these many years, isn't entirely alone, at least not in experience. She joined a long line of violently destroyed victims of well, whatever her mother was thinking. And she did think, there is no question about that. Don't forget to look for Rosemary Clooney's Hey There. Give it a listen and keep in mind the teenager Lucretia Spolino who had hopes and dreams that she longed to fulfill. In fact, for some real irony, also listen to Rosemary's What Are You Doing the Rest of Your Life? The pain of the one and the irony of the other is quite extraordinary when thinking of Lucretia and others who were kept in similar circumstances. Thank you for joining me, and be well.